like to introduce our second keynote speaker of the conference. Dr. Karen Cooper. So Dr. Cooper is an associate professor at North Carolina State University in the U.S. She is director of research partnerships with SciStarter, the largest searchable repository of citizen science projects. Karen's research focuses on birds, public stewardship for birds, and community pollution monitoring and mapping. Karen has over 50 publications to her name and also serves on the U.S. Citizen Science Board of Directors. So please welcome Karen, and as I mentioned, Karen will also be speaking at the public lecture tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, great. And this mic, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Well, you'll tell me if you can't. All right. Well, hi. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm so thrilled and grateful to have been invited um, to the conference, um, and I'm having a great time. Uh, so I, um, well, I wanted to start with this Lily Tomlin quote, um, just because I think she's hilarious, and because I think there's something about it that really embodies a part of citizen science, um, because I think that citizen science can help us get that help us, like our, our social movements, environmental movements, get past this sort of mentality that we need like a single hero to come and champion and fix all of our problems. Because instead, with citizen science, we really can have it be that people, that every, anybody, right, can unite together in a way so that anybody becomes somebody <laughs> and is making an impact. Um, and I normally, uh, or very often I speak about um, circumstances where scientists like me need access to citizen science in order to advance our research agendas. Um, but lately, I've been embarking on a different type of citizen science that is really to support social movements. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, in a little bit. I'm also going to talk about, um, about how we manage our volunteers and how that um, I guess how we might think a little bit differently about managing our volunteers as like our volunteers and your volunteers to really thinking collectively about volunteers as sort of this shared renewable resource almost that we cultivate and grow together. Um, but before I get started, I just wanted to mention that my journey into citizen science actually started in Australia. Um, I did my PhD uh, research up in Armidale, New South Wales and uh, studying this little bird. <laughs> and uh, it's the brown tree creeper. And I came here, um, this was over 20 years ago, I came here with my husband, who's an astronomer, I have to say. But he was so excited, finally, about birds when we got to Australia. There's all these bright, colorful birds. And he's like, oh, is that your bird? Is that your bird? Is that? And I'm like, it's that little brown one on the ground there. Uh, but it has a big personality. <laughs> Anyway, and, and that was great, and I loved field work. I had been doing field work for a long time before that. Uh, but, but just before my last field season, I became a mom and then had another. Anyway, so I started a family, and field work wasn't so appealing anymore. <laughs> so I have to say, um, I mean, a, a little embarrassed almost to say, but like my entry into citizen science was very selfish, was that there was, uh, well, there was a job at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology right as I was finishing, and basically a whole you know, nation of bird watching volunteers to do all the field work, so I didn't have to. But as my kids grew, so did my interest and appreciation of citizen science, and, it, and my view really expanded, and I see citizen science, it's just such hope and inspiration in it um, that I see as my kids have grown, and especially now as they're young adults facing what I see as a very uncertain world. And so, um, yeah, I, I, figured, I wasn't sure like what are the hot topics in citizen science in Australia, but I thought I'm being brought here as a foreign perspective, so I thought I would talk about what was a hot topic in my neck of the woods, and, and that is social movements and how they relate to citizen science. And, um, and where I live in North Carolina, actually um, decades ago is where the environmental movement and the civil rights movement actually met and formed what's called the environmental justice movement. And the environmental justice movement places heavy emphasis on ending what's called environmental racism. Okay, and that's when, that's sort of um, circumstances where, um, where there's oppression 
of marginalized people in the form of disproportionate burdens of environmental risks compared to the benefits. Um, anyway, so right now <laughs> in the US, uh, you know, there's, there's a big rise in a lot of different types of hate. Um, and well, you may, some of you may know that the Citizen Science Association in the US was going to host our conference this past year in North Carolina. And we actually moved it to Minnesota because of anti-transgender laws in North Carolina which we have now repealed, yay, to the new governor, Governor Cooper, but no relation. Uh, and, and so we'll host the next conference. Um, but anyway, so you might be asking, like, how can this even be related to citizen science? But I think a lot of citizen science has goals of conservation and sustainability. And I think that we can't really achieve a sustainable world if we don't also achieve a just and equitable world. I think they really go hand in hand. and. Um, and the environmental justice movement actually draws very heavily on citizen science in its efforts. Um, but what I want to do with that really, I think it's really an exercise in looking really critically at citizen science design, how we design our projects and what we design them for, and being really conscious about that. So I'm going to use it to sort of illustrate how we can think about citizen science design. Um, so I think, I think a lot of us use these typologies when we think about citizen science projects, right? Jennifer Shirk and Rick Bonney and those, this kind of typology of contributory, collaborative, and co-created. Just I want to see a show of hands. Everyone knows that one, right? Does everyone pretty much know that one? Okay. Um, you know, and there's other typologies that are out there, and I kind of like John Tweddle's, um, he just sort of reduced this one to just, it's a continuum, <laughs> right? And this just means it's a continuum of how people contribute, how volunteers contribute to citizen science, whether they're just, you know, contributing data, all the way to whether they're contributing into other parts of sci other science activities. Um, and then I don't know if you saw this, like, behemoth one that Mookie Hackley just came out with, which I thought was great. I love him. <laughs> but anyway, um, and these are all useful typologies for different reasons for when you're planning citizen science projects and thinking about design. But what really none of them take into account is sort of the, the history or almost the, like, phylogeny of how, um, and the, of, of really what's embodied in the complexity of these terms. So what I'm saying is, so for example, on this spectrum of contributory citizen science, right, and people know what I mean by that, of people, it's like a top-down approach of like scientists designing protocols and whatnot and people contributing data versus a co-created project, which is bottom-up, right, of a community and scientists working together creating a project. You know, we talk about them in those two terms, but there's often these suite of design features that occur so frequently in that particular design that we come to think of it as just inherent to that design. And we might not even think about how we might mix and match these things. So just to walk through this a little bit, I mean, in contributory citizen science, we often work with enthusiasts or aficionados, right, people who are curious. Um, and it's often large scale, so it's geographically dispersed populations. I mean, people contributing from all over. Whereas in co-created citizen science, oftentimes it's with human subjects in some context of that, whether it's pollution exposures or health, whatever. It's often with, it's local with a community of place and driven by concerns. Um, in contributory projects, like the focus is on data collection, whereas in co-created, it might be on the full science process. Contributory, like as it often has massive participation, geographically dispersed, which is why it relies often on communication mediated by the internet, whereas co-created projects in communities of place can have face-to-face -face communications. That has tons of design implications. And like often, there's other contexts that are different. Um, you know, in terms of the, how the data can be used, how robust it might be. There's different language in contributory. We're often talking about recruitment, retention, protocols, and skills. In co-created projects, it's often language about trust and equity, risk, and action. Um, anyway, and it is really contributory projects that have really bloomed in biodiversity conservation, whereas in environmental justice in that space is really heavily relied on community-based or co-created types of citizen science. Um, and so the, the demographics between those kinds of, those designs of projects really differ and sort of what kind of things they support. So it kind of reminds me like of, of life history theory. I mean, just because I'm an ornithologist and, uh, and like sort of how we think of these suites of traits and 
This is not for Twitter. <laughs> this is a joke, so do not photograph it. It won't translate well to people not in this room. <laughs> so I'm just making this up. But so, like, we, you know, if you think about phylogenetic history, like, you have, like, your feathered animals, right? And they have certain bills. They have certain feet. You expect to go with a feathered animal. You have your furry animals, and they have certain snouts, and they have certain feet that you expect to go with it. And you just, it's unnatural to see any kind of mismatch of things that would be in one category and not the other. Anyway, and that's sort of how I'm thinking about these typologies and all these suites of characteristics that we associate with contributory or associate with co-created projects. Because I want to mix and match them, right? So I want to do contributory citizen science that, de that addresses issues of trust and equity, that addresses environmental justice, that supports community-based environmental justice, and that broadens engagement to marginalized peoples, um, and that supports social movement. Um, anyway, so that's sort of the area that I'm diving into. I'm just going to share a little bit about. Um, so just first, a little history. I guess this, so this is an example of community-based, co-created citizen science for environmental justice in my home state. And it's about um, environmental racism related to uh, CAFOs, which stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. So there are these farms, and you can see in that picture that those, each of those buildings contain literally thousands of hogs. Right? So this is factory hog farming. And, um, and so they pipe in food, they pipe out the waste into that pond, these kind of settling ponds that you can see, they're about 30 feet deep, even though the wells in that area are about 15 feet deep. Um, and that, I mean, it's like the sewage that comes out of there is actually like a small city, but there's no sewage treatment. So they pump it into the ponds, and then they had these spray fields where they would just spray all that urine and feces out, and you can see how green the pasture is there right around the facility. Um, but when spraying it, like that would put particulates in the air that goes in the wind that goes into the towns right next door. And where these were appearing um, were, it was in this area of North Carolina that's known as the Black Belt. And, um, and each town was getting these and really wasn't, didn't know what to do. They thought it was just their problem. Um, and then seven of these were planned around this town called Tillery up in the northern part. And Tillery just happens to be, even though it's one of the poorest counties, <laughs> Tillery happens to be in a town with a lot of social capital. And it's led uh, by this fellow, Gary Grant, who, has a, um, who runs like a community center, and people come for miles around to go there. Um, and he and Naima Mohammed, who's a community organizer, got together on this issue and were exploring it. And they went to the state legislature, and they said, we think that, that these um, CAFOs are actually harming human health. And the legislature said, prove it, <laughs> right? So they put the burden of proof on people to show that it was a problem rather than on industry to show that it was safe. And so how do people prove something, right, scientifically? So they needed access to citizen science. So they started working um, with Steve Wing, who at the time, um, well, he recently passed away. He was a real champion of environmental justice uh, citizen science. He was in the School of Public Health at UNC. And they organized research, and the first thing they did was really to look at the geographic patterns of the hog farms in relation to the demographics of the, um, the state. And what they found was that more than by chance, these um, operations were more likely to be next to people of color and poor people, and intersectionally, especially poor people of color. Um, and they published papers on that, and they also used that to mobilize communities to do citizen science where they... Um, Naima trained people to take, uh, to, to follow a protocol of being outside, taking self-health measurements, especially time stamps, like everything they could do to make it high quality and validated. And then there were trailers that were out there recording air quality, right? And then what they found was when the sulfates were going up from the hog farms, health was just plummeting, and when the sulfates were lower, health was improving. Um, and they published more papers, they campaigned more, they did a lot of at political action, and they ended up getting a moratorium on those open spray fields, right? And the system is so, I mean, that isn't a great accomplishment, but the system is so broken that it really is like a Band-Aid, and that's the best um, that we can hope for at the moment. Um, and I think a lot of community-based um, and co-created citizen science has that lineage in public health, starting with people as human subjects, a lot of atrocities happening there, people really um, demanding to be research partners in the process. And this mantra of nothing about us without us or, or no research about me without me. 
um, has become a mantra in that movement, that people want to have a seat at the table in the planning and in the initiation and all, all aspects of that project. And anyway, and that's sort of where we come from with this. Um, I think it's important to understand that lineage of how those things arose. Because contributory citizen science, I think what we're all used to with biodiversity monitoring, has, I think, a very different lineage that really comes from scientists um, like really pushing the envelope and reaching points where they can't make new discoveries unless they ask for more help and involve more people. Right? And we see that way back in the 1760s um, with the transit of Venus, and actually even 100 years before that in the 1660s with the transit of Mars. And those were both inter you know, collaborations of people across the globe coordinating to take you know, time measurement, like noting the time for the transits so that we could triangulate and compute the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And, um, you know, and then later there were more of these kinds of um, big collaborative projects. This was in the uh, early 1800s. William Hewell um, uh, was a scholar in England and he was using observations that people were making around the world um, of the tides, right, and of using tide gauges. But they were out of sync and so then he actually organized an in sync, like a two week long citizen science project, obviously not by that name, <laughs> um, where he had recruited people on both sides of the Atlantic to measure the tide marks at exactly the same times, every 15 minutes, day and night, for two weeks straight. Can you imagine orchestrating and that without the internet, <laughs> without phones? And then if you do the math, that was about 800,000 observations that was then sent to him to process without a computer. <laughs> Okay. But of course he did have computers, these are fellows that knew math, um, who actually did the calculus for him. Um, and he won a royal, like a medal, a royal medal from the Royal Society for that work. Um, and he, I could go on and on about him, it's fascinating, um, but I'll just say that he also really did help transform science um, from being something that only wealthy people do. Like, so this was like the transformation that he did. It just, it didn't, if he didn't have a wealthy benefactor, you could still do science. It, but he still made it very hierarchical, and he called the people that collected the data, the people that even just did the calculus, his subordinate laborers. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, he coined the term scientist, and the first time he used it, because um, they were called natural philosophers, right? they were called men of science, and he didn't want to call Mary Somerville a man of science, and he called her a scientist. And I don't know how it was meant back then, but I have suspicions. Um, but anyway, he took it back um, a year later uh, because then there was a meeting of the Royal Society and there was an actual philosopher, like an armchair philosopher, who was there and he said, stop calling yourselves philosophers. I'm a philosopher. You are sci you know, you, he didn't say scientist. He goes, you carry out, you know, you're in the labs, you're in the field mucking around, you're something different. And Hewell, who was very young at the time, actually spoke up and said, we should be called scientists, although it was decades before it caught on. But this is how he described it. He says, you know, an artist, it's like this umbrella term. An artist is a musician, a painter, a poet, and we need this umbrella term for people who are mathematicians, physicists, naturalists. We should be called scientists. And it kind of reminds me of citizen science because there are so many varieties and ways and people doing DIY, bio, citizen science crowdsourcing, and we're calling them citizen scientists. Um, Anyway, and his contemporary was uh, in the U.S. at the time was uh, Matthew Fontaine Mowry, who made these charts, crowdsourcing from sailors. He had specialized logbooks he gave sailors in 13 different countries to, to record information about the wind and the currents. And pooling that together to make these navigation charts, basically, made sailing safer and faster for everyone. And as one of the sailors wrote to him and said, until I took up your work, I had been traversing the ocean blindfolded. And I think that's really at the heart of discovery, right? It's not like we're creating things. We're just discovering what's already there. And by pooling observations together and really revealing things that we wouldn't otherwise see. Um, and I think that, in many ways, is the sort of the roots of this contributory style citizen science that is now really dominates biodiversity conservation um, for lots of really good reasons. And it's super powerful. And it is so powerful. We even see health sciences now using these same kinds of approaches. So I don't know if people are familiar with patients like me. Is a portal. It's kind of like the Facebook for people who have chronic illnesses and are managing those chronic illnesses, um, so they can share about their what medications they're taking, their symptoms, their standardized like metrics for measuring it, or their uh, you know how they respond to treatments. 
and they knowingly, I mean, they have in consent as to whether they want to share those data with pharmaceutical companies for research, be in drug trials, whatever. It's helping really rapidly advance medical research. Um, and uh, Silent Spring Institute, which is a grassroots organization that formed um, from people with cancer that actually were frustrated that NIH, our National Institute of Health, was so heavily funding cures for cancer um, because they thought they were in a cluster. I mean, maybe, and they, I don't want to say they thought it. They're in a cluster that um, they're concerned about the environmental causes of cancer. They want to support research that actually can prevent cancers from happening in the first place and not just funding cures. Anyway, but so they normally do community-based citizen science. Um, but they've actually also even branched into doing more of a crowdsourcing, and it's super expensive, it's pretty expensive at the moment, can send in urine samples to um, see what kind of really common household chemicals are, are, that we bring into our house um, are in us, and then do their detox program. Uh, spoiler alert, don't use plastics, don't microwave in plastics, um, and see if some of those contaminants are, are eliminated. Um, anyway. So I think there's several reasons that contributory citizen science could be super valuable for supporting social movements like environmental justice that has typically only drawn on community-based. For example, like should we really know more about the exact distribution of birds than we know about the distribution of contaminants in the environment that can kill us? I mean, and I love that we know about birds. I'm not saying we shouldn't know about birds, and it's great we have tons of bird watchers, but wouldn't it be great if we had an equal number of people that were monitoring pollution, and that we didn't just rely so heavily on satellite-derived data, but had more on-the-ground sensors and people making those kinds of observations? And there's also reasons to consider this in terms of who benefits from citizen science, because it really does produce a social good. And this is just an example from Coco Ross, which is a super popular um, precipitation citizen science project in the US. It involves just putting out a standardized rain gauge. It attracts tons of people who are like weather bugs, they're called. And, um, but, it tends, but they tend to be white. And, uh, and unfortunately, in the US, our neighborhoods are still very racially segregated. And it's a project you do at home. And so, um, well, really, with Coco Ross data, what it's super great for is fine scale predictions of flood risk, right? Because precipitation is very fine scale. It can rain on one side of the street, not the other. They can make super fine scale predictions of flood risk, but because their participants tend to be white, because neighborhoods are racially segregated, they actually can't make fine scale predictions of flood risk in African American communities. So there's this disparity even in the benefits of who's benefiting from citizen science because of the way the projects are are packaged and maybe perhaps not able to reach all the different communities. Uh, but I think the biggest reason is because I don't really think that there's really any such thing anymore as a local problem. And, and projects, um, you know, dealing with communities of place, uh, I mean, it, feel, it is a problem that affects everyone locally, but any any um, community of place is embedded in such a wider system of social exchanges and economics and policy that impinge on that place. And so things can happen and actions can happen to sort of fix the symptom in that local place, but it's not really addressing the larger cause. And so I think that um, contributory citizen science like we do in biodiversity to really complement community-based efforts could be super powerful. Um, so this, I mean, because in the U.S. anyway, this is how it looks. There's community after community that stands up and says, oh my gosh, you know, we have this oil refinery, or we have this traffic pollution, or we, we have some problem, and then on their own, they're scrambling to fix it. And I think that there needs to be some kind of scaffolding, basically, to support those efforts. And that scaffolding is contributory style citizen science, because then we have, um, then we have baseline data, then we have standardized protocols, then we have reference communities. We have big data that has more robust fitness for use. Um, anyway, and I'm super excited that environmental justice leaders are excited about this new approach. Um, and because when working with, you know, when problems arise, it is great to be able to be responsive to community needs. But I think as we shift and bring in some of those practices, from co-created projects and bring them to contributory style projects, we're going to be able to be proactive and prevent these problems from happening in the first place. 
So I'll just thought I'd mention really briefly. So when I was first getting into this area, I was still doing this through my ornithology. And I was like, well, how does ornithology and environmental justice come together? Um, and so anyway, Sparrow Swap is a project um, where I actually work with bluebirders. Like these are, blue, are bird air enthusiasts who are very particularly interested in one type of, of bird, which are bluebirds. They are whole nesting species. Um, and they, so they take to nest boxes. But they battle house sparrows which are a, a pest species. And so people who are bluebird monitors, when they encountered the eggs, they were throwing them away. And um, so I created, kind of co-created this project with them. They are a dispersed community. Um, but we sort of co-create the project. For them, their interest is in how to minimize damage from the house sparrows and figure out best management practices. But what I really like, too, is that they're sending me thousands of eggs and we're building this collection to really look at whether, because they vary tremendously, and there's only two pigments that influence egg coloration, and both of those pigments are influenced by um, their production, and synthesis is influenced by contaminants in the environment and other stressors. And so we're hoping we might see some kind of signal in those eggs that they can be like an early warning as to what kind of contaminants are in the environment. Um, that's the long-term goal of it. But that scene is too low tech for most uh, funders. <laughs> anyway, so I'm also moving to higher tech solutions. Um, and I'm working with um, our engineering center at NC State. It's called the Assist Center. And these are folks that are making um, health and environmental sensors that are low power. So they don't require batteries. They use this nanotechnology that it runs like on human motion and whatnot. So it's for wearables. But what they do, you know, what the academics do is they take these products and they take them to what's called technology readiness level five. That means that it all works in the lab in a controlled environment. And then they hand that off to industry partners. And where I live is the center, it's Research Triangle Park is what it's called, and it's got lots of different industries, many of those making these sensors. And so they hand it off to the industry partners and they bring it up to technology readiness level nine, which means it's ready for market. And when they do that, they typically do work with different public to like see what works. It's usually farmers. But we want them to work, we're trying to arrange for them to work with environmental justice communities so that the products they make are going to be useful. And we figure that is almost in some ways, at least financially, like the lowest common denominator. If they can build sensors that are useful for environmental justice purposes, then it's going to be useful for so many purposes. And because um, we don't just want them to make sensors that are useful for just an individual and the company that gets that, those data, but for networks for people to share in a citizen science context. And, um, you know, you can look, I mean, citizen scientists use, we can look at birders, they spend money for equipment, um, right? And uh, Fitbits, you know, are about the price of cheap, cheaper end of binoculars. And um, anyway, it just brings us to this notion about the Internet of Things. Right? Are people familiar with that, with the Internet of Things? And that little graph is just one I grabbed that um, the yellow is people, the amount of people on the planet, and the blue are the amount of things connected to the Internet on the planet. And that's the projection. But actually, in 2008 is when we sort of crossed the line where there were more things than there were people. And, um, and the thing about that is that a lot of that is just unwitting um, data sharing. It's not explicitly participatory. And we saw this really hit the news last week with Strava and their heat maps. And I think it was an Australian maybe that even uncovered this problem. But so um, Strava, you know, collects, uh, there was, there was uh, US military folks who were tracking their fitness with apps that were sharing data with Strava, right? So they're working out and doing whatever. And they clicked the terms of use. But, Raise your hand if you've ever read a terms of use, <laughs> right? No, of course not. So it's not actually informed consent. Anyway, so they, and then Strava decides, oh, let's make a heat map and let it, and show publicly where all the, where's all the fitness hotspots. And so, yes, yeah, some Australians looking at it and going, huh, that's a fitness hotspot in Afghanistan in a place that doesn't exist, right? Yeah, because it's a secret military base that now everybody knows about. And it's this big breach of national security, right? And it really happened because because this is unwitting participation. And we know, all of us in this room know the power of citizen science and when it's intentional participation and all of the advantages that that holds. And so I think we really need to advocate for the Internet of Things to become a more explicitly participatory type of sensing and not just unwittingly taking data. 
And it's the same for smart cities, where companies are deciding like where to put sensors in our cities. And urban planners know this. They are familiar with Arnstein's ladder of participation. We need to demand that that is explicitly participatory and that there is citizen control, or at least partnerships and shared decision making in how we go about ubiquitous sensing. And, um, and yes, and making sensing participatory in the right way. And it's not just humans. I don't know if anyone knows this project in England, which I love. Do you, anyone want to guess what those little sensors are for? <laughs> They're pigeons. <laughs> and, and I really want to... Uh, so the Assist Center actually does make wearables for dogs. And so now we're talking about making them for other types of wildlife uh, and pigeon fanciers. Um, anyway, but so, uh, so yeah, I've been exploring about air pollution. That's what the Assist Center is mostly um, creating sensors for. Um, and I've also been working with the National Park Service on noise pollution. And this is one of their national maps that shows um, anthropogenic sounds um, across the country. And they have another map of natural sounds. And, um, and it's modeled from data that they've mostly collected from airports and parks. But these data have already been used to show that noise pollution is an environmental justice issue, meaning that neighborhoods that are poor and of people of color are more likely to have that burden of noise pollution. And it's typically traffic, which probably also carries a burden of air pollution. And that's one of the things... Uh, Anyway, so we're starting, so they've had a protocol for a long time for professionals in the Park Service to collect these recordings, and we've worked them, with them to now start this project called Sound Around Town, which involves loaning out their type of sound recording equipment through libraries so that people deploy it in their backyards to improve those maps, and so that we can more carefully look and understand those disparities in noise pollution. And um, we're, we're, well, we just submitted a proposal to do this both sound and air quality um, and do this with the NAACP. And the NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization in the United States. Um, and so their mission is social justice and it expands into environmental justice, which is why they need citizen science. And, um, you know, and it's just exciting. It's because they're such an old organization that they have chapters all over the country that do outreach in their community. Right, so they're perfectly in place to do and bring up environmental justice, citizen science. So this is, map is just showing one of our EPA regions, and it shows where the EPA has their stationary sensors, which are the black dots, and then where all the clear dots are where there are NAACP chapters that will be reaching out. Um, uh, so you, it's just a many-fold more density of sensors that are out there. Um, and then the project that just got funded, and it probably won't have this name or this little graphic, but um, was this with Mark Edwards, who sort of led the, I don't know if people heard about the Flint water crisis, it was about lead in water. Um, anyway, and now we are going to start a national uh, project. We can't measure everybody's water and lead content, but we can model the risks based on certain factors. And part of that is teaching people how to figure out what type of plumbing they have in their house and in their service lines. Um, anyway. And I'm super excited and terrified about this project because, um, and I've been starting to consult with scholars in risk communication because the way we carry this out and the communication with it needs to maintain public trust. And um, yeah, and it's going to be tricky. <laughs> um, and it needs to be able to combat fake news. There, there's so many issues with, when, with these kind of controversial topics. Um, so speaking about how we communicate with volunteers, I guess that's something I wanted to just transition to a little bit, is how we approach how we manage our volunteers. And my main point here for project, people who have projects is you are not alone in having projects, right? There are thousands of citizen science projects, but often when we think about our volunteers, and we're so focused on our project, we think about our volunteers, like literally as our volunteers. But they, but, and we work in a silo oftentimes, but volunteers are amazing and do so many things and so many projects is what we are finding. Um, and so I think we need to think more broadly a little bit about um, this. Anyway, so let me just explain. I've been getting really interested in social science research related to multi-project participation. And, um, and so, well, I guess what this, our results from is a survey of people in the Christmas bird count. Christmas Bird Count is the oldest um, avian citizen science project, the longest running citizen science project with birds in the U.S. It started in 1900. 
and Audubon approached me to study uh, participants because um, they it's been running that long and no one had ever studied them <laughs> anyway we thought okay let's look at people who do just the Christmas bird count and compare them to people who do other bird projects and then for fun we asked some questions about other citizen science thank goodness because what we found first was all respondents we had like 3,000 or so respondents they all did more than one bird project no one just does the Christmas bird count they all do more um, and then over a third of them also do other they're looking at bugs bird I mean sky butterflies like water doing all kinds of citizen science and so we decided to compare people who just do birds with people who have broader interests and compare them in how much they contribute to the Christmas bird count and to citizen science and we found because we thought it was this like either you're a dabbler or you have real depth but no that was a false dichotomy the people that had that sort of varied experience were also the deep divers and contributed so much more to the Christmas bird count and we also asked a lot of questions about their conservation behaviors and on every single item we found that people who were multi-project participants like across disciplines were stronger in their were more likely to do these conservation activities and we found that they um, were very likely to attribute doing it to their citizen science experience anyway so I think there's a lot of value in understanding our participants not just in our projects but how they interact across this whole ecosystem of citizen science projects that's out there and um, oh, we also did a, a little study on onlooker effects based on what was done here in Australia with the first great koala count there was a great paper that was done looking at people who signed up for the project and submitted data people who signed up but didn't participate and then people who never even heard of it and looking at how those three groups um, their views on policy for managing koalas and how it really differed and the onlookers who signed up but didn't do it kind of fell in between and we had very similar results that we did with kayakers who sample sample water quality in New York City um, and this they don't really sign up they're on a listserv and some measure the water quality and some just look at the data and we actually found they were totally similar in terms of using the data deciding when to go kayaking and in their conservation and advocacy approaches um, which is really just to say when we think about um, all the added benefits of citizen science we need to think about our volunteers in a very broad sense and not just those contributing data um, anyway so we're going to be doing some social network analysis of the projects right of the projects and how people move among projects in this ecosystem so we can start to see like which projects are the gateways which are gateways to just that discipline which are boundary spanners and gateways to other things which move people from online to on the ground out in the field all those kind of questions and then projects can start to see where they really sit in this ecosystem and is that where they want to be and we'll be looking at the characteristics of volunteers what those patterns are and what their learning outcomes are from that and we're going to do that on two platforms so SciStarter is the largest repository of citizen science projects it shares data behind the scenes um, with um, the um, Atlas of Living Australia um, anyway so we're going to start actually our initial work with ALA um, because BioCollect and Digivol have so many you know have projects it's just way easier a <laughs> simpler system right now actually to see what's going on because with SciStarter and in the US especially um, there's a zillion projects but they're all on different platforms and so we kind of have to jerry-rig the system and start to connect them with APIs after the fact so that we can see what people are doing because people come to SciStarter before and they would just search for a project presumably find it and leave and we didn't know what happened and so now we're starting to be able to see what happened as more and more projects adopt these tools so that we're sort of a more networked ecosystem but what we're finding is that it's really hard given project owner perceptions about volunteer management to convince them to do this why should they have participants that go into this bigger ecosystem they might lose them there's all kind of fears about about losing their participants um, but they are open to like what our studies might show and um, and recognize you know just that some of this movement is normal and that really a rising tide lifts all boats and that if we can manage our volunteers collectively really well then people are going to have great citizen science experiences and we're all going to benefit from that okay um, anyway and so also in looking at volunteer and learning outcomes you know if you're in that space you know that a lot of the problem with that research or a lot of challenge is that people self-select I mean they're volunteers right so they're self-selecting so we might try to look at conservation outcomes 
but they come in already, they're doing it because they have conservation interests. So they're not gaining a lot in that regard. So we're working on bringing in sort of people that wouldn't otherwise have citizen science experiences. We're working with companies who have staff, corporate volunteer programs, right? And instead of sending their staff to do their four hours of volunteering out at Habitat for Humanity, they'll have a, a campaign where they have them do citizen science. Um, we have Girl Scouts who have a special, they earn badges now, citizen science badges. I don't know if you have an equivalent of Girl Scouts, but they, um, so they have a special portal that they do these journeys in. My university is becoming a citizen science campus. We want every student to have citizen science experiences, either in the classroom or co as an extracurricular. So we are customizing SciStarter so that they don't need a new account. They just use their NC State credentials. It has a landing page. There's focal projects that they do right there on campus. Um, anyway, and then we're also taking uh, Tina Phillips' scales that she developed for Devise. I hope people are familiar with those. These are like a standardized set of validated instruments for looking at different learning outcomes. And we're going to be using those, but we're going to change it because we're worried about survey fatigue. And so we're creating what we're calling embedded assessments, which is like trying to embed a lot of different experiences in SciStarter that are fun. Quizzes, you know, like what kind of... I only know these from women's magazines, but they must be out there elsewhere. But like, what kind of conservationist are you, you know? Or what kind of citizen, whatever. I'm a Hufflepuff. I, you know, like you come up with these kind of things. Um, you know, or different types of games that can help us understand their science efficacy. Um, and, and those will be available, whatever. You know, they'll be available to anybody. Um, anyway, so all this really just leads me to conclude with, these are the initiatives um, that are happening at uh, NC State. So I'm a faculty at NC State, but my research lab is really, as part of my joint appointment, is at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences downtown. And my students and I work behind this glass wall, like the whole lab has a glass wall. Visitors come in and see us. They press their nose up against the wall. Kids love to watch um, us do whatever work we're doing. And uh, anyway, this was my lab from this past summer. I don't have my current, all my current students there, although some of those are my grad students. And, um, and it's funny because I wrote, well, my publisher in my book made the title of my book, and the subheading is um, uh, Ordinary People Changing the Face of Discovery. And what I have found with citizen science is that it is also changing the face and the demographics to some extent of science, of the professional side, and drawing more women and minorities in because it is so much more publicly engaged and relevant and just seems to be of more interest. Anyway, with that, if there's time, I'll take any questions. Thank you.